any good nuggets or anything that uh <laughs> yeah you know just in case yeah no definitely no so it's funny we <laughs> we connected sort of I, it was definitely 2021 i don't think it was 2020 right I think it was like summer of 21 and yep. obviously the world was on fire and everything and it's so neat when i looked at your imdb and now i look again like when i reconnected with you and it uh-huh. looks like you got some things back in the works that's awesome yeah yeah there are a few things going on so that's really it's exciting good, you know now i just need to find my angel investor and i'm good <laughs> oh for something you're writing or producing something i'm producing and directing cool so, have you directed yeah, I before have, I, yeah i did a short before but you know it's it's one of those things where it was really bizarre because as soon as i got behind the camera i was like oh this is really natural <laughs> supernatural for me so i went uh-huh okay and then a script came to me through um darren mcbee who i was in mortal Kombat with oh nice and he had tried to get this thing off the ground in the 80s and was like, oh, I want you to direct this. And I'm like, okay, cool. So we're in the works with that. That's cool. How did directing come about? Was there like a short film festival and you were like, let me take a stab at it? Or... No, it was somebody that I had met in the industry like, oh my God, 20 years ago. And he was a fan when I was acting. And was like, hey, I have this comic book that I really want you to star in, the oh, wow. feature film of it. And I'm like, okay, cool. And it just has never happened. And then a few years ago, he was like, well, do you want to direct? And I'm like, yeah, I want to direct. That's always been my plan, was to go from in front of the camera to behind the camera. Always. Nice. And he was like, well, let's do this short film. And I'm like, Okay. And we ran into a, some complications and things like that. But, you know, it's done. But as soon as I did that, I was like, okay, I need to do this more. Yeah. No, I've talked to people and you've been, you've done what every actor wants to do is to get on a series that you're on there for a while with yeah. Beastmaster. And, I, and uh, I don't know if there's like a certain episode limit that actors, that, that shows have to be. But a lot of times, and I never knew this until I talked to... The name escapes me. An actor was on. Uh, he was on Star Trek Voyager, and he said, like in the second year, when they knew, like, hey, this is working, mm-hmm. they were like, hey, uh, do you want to try to direct? So there was like one week every year that he yeah. was like watching everything and learning. Did you? Did they offer that on on that show? No, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we only went three seasons on Beastmaster, so. Okay. Yeah, so it was, I came on season two, and then season three, they were like, oh, we're not going to continue. Oh. I was like, Ugh. But I had written a script that was, you know, like geared towards season four, and I submitted it to them, and they were like, this is really, this is really good. We can't, wow. we're not going to make it. But it's really good. So that to me was really, you know, when I um, talked to the showrunner about it and he was like, you know, Marjane, you, that's your, you've got what it takes to be a writer and you should pursue it. He said, because he came (laughs) from being an actor and was like, as soon as I started writing and directing, that's when my whole world just opened up. He said, you know, and I didn't miss acting at all. Yeah. So I no, like, it, cool. I could see that. You learn everything, you know, while mm-hmm. you're in front of the camera. And then when you're behind the camera, you know the things to tell actors because you did the job yes. before. And they respect you more because you're like, you know, I've done it for 30 years, 40 years. And then they'd be able to help them out. But I think Beastmaster is so fascinating because I, it, it's so crazy. They did that Beastmaster TV movie, like I think like two years before that. That was like a, originally supposed to be like a Beastmaster four, mm-hmm. and then they were gonna try to la- launch it into a movie. And it's so crazy that the people they got to be in that show, and it was just like a one pilot movie. It was right. like Patrick Kilpatrick, Tony Todd was in it, uh-huh. and obviously what Mark uh, Singer his name Mark Singer was in it. And you're like wow, mm-hmm. but uh, that's so cool that there was a series. But here's what I would right. like to find out from people the most: okay, is how how did it all begin? 
So you grew up in Minnesota. Yes. Well, and I was like, born in Minnesota, okay. moved to Colorado when I was almost eight, and was there until I graduated high school. And in fourth grade, I produced, directed, and starred in my first production, you know, wow. The Three okay. Little Pigs. Because <laughs> that's what you do when you're in fourth grade, right? So we had done this play, <laughs> and it was... I got a, you know, like a, an accommodation at school, like a, a, an award for doing that. And I came home and I told my mom, I'm going to be an actress. And she was like, Oh, that's nice, dear. (laughs) Like, okay. And then when I went to college, I had met some people that were doing a short film and they needed production assistance. So I went and I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll help you guys. They're a bunch of college guys and they're, you know, directing and producing and they're like getting into the business. And I was like, cool, I'll come help you, you know, and I just kind of, you know, did whatever they needed to be done, right, in production. And they yeah. said to me, so, hey, there's this film that's going to be shooting and they're looking for production assistance. You should go and apply. And I went. Okay, so I went over to the production office and applied as a production assistant on a movie called Campus Man. Campus Man? Who was in that? Anyone? um, John Dye, Kathleen Wilhoyt, Steve Lyon, and... Oh, my God. She was on Army Wives. Um, And this was at the school you were at? They were going to shoot at the college you went to? This was at ASU. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So John Landau was the producer and yeah. And I was like, Oh, I need a job. So they hired me. (laughs) They hired me as a production assistant. So I worked in the office from the minute the production started until the very end of the production. I was the last, like me and one of the accountants were the last people (laughs) in the office. We literally shut the office. And after that production, a another production came to town and they were looking for production assistance so i was like hey i've got you know experience and i went over to their office and got a job over there that happened to be bill and ted's excellent adventure whoa that shot at asu too Uh uh-huh wow and steve herrick was the director on that and there was a part in there for a student giving a speech on stage and I had gotten a job as a model for a magazine over in France and went over, shot all of the editorial stuff, came back. And as soon as I came back, the director and Stephen said, Hey, there's this part. I've auditioned everybody here and I didn't like anyone. Do you want the part? And I went, Sure. So that's how I got my first part in the film industry. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah. So how, so how did modeling come about? Just, I know my buddy went to ASU. This is uh he went in like the two thousands and there's like mm-hmm. miss ASU and they do like that. Is that something they did in the eighties too? Or I mean, they, they might've, but that's not how I big party school. That's not how I got into it. Huge party school. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I was a Sigma new little sister. So <laughs> I was around all the, the, you know, fraternity row and, you know, all of the parties and all of that stuff. But I, you know, really was like, hey, I want to be a model and found an agency there and just kind of sort of started doing things slowly and really kept going and kept going and then when Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure was wrapped there was one of the production uh, at the time she was I don't know if she was a line producer or whatever but she needed her car driven back to LA (laughs) and I was like I'll drive it back for you (laughs) no big deal because she was going on to another production and she couldn't take her car back so I drove her car back to her place in L.A. There was a our special effects guy, um, Barry Nolan, was like, hey, do you want to move to L.A.? If you're moving to L.A., I have a condo 
in, in North Hollywood. Do you want to rent it? And I'm like, yeah. Do you want to see it first? <laughs> nope. If it's yours, I don't need to, you know. And then, you know, got my sister and my brother. And was like, we're moving to California. <laughs> okay. Were they older, younger? Older. They're both older. Yeah. Nice. And moved to L.A. in May of 1987. Wow. And then yeah. that that's like where it took off, like your IMDb, like right away. Was yeah. it from the line producer or the special effects guy? Did they put you in with anyone or you just went to no, open casting? I just went to open castings. I, you know, hit the road and tried to get agents and found an agent and then met some other girls and, and you know, just kind of started working in the industry and was like, you know, I worked up at Universal Studios for about three months as a tour guide, I thought, oh, this will be a great way to, you know, <laughs> get my foot in the door. <laughs> Not really. Um, <laughs> you know, because all you're doing is really doing the tour. That's it. So, but I learned a lot about the film industry. I learned more than I could ever want to know about Universal Studios <laughs> and all of the production there. And it was, you know, it was really cool because... We had to know everything from the start of the tour to the end of the tour. So, and my brother worked as a tour guide as well. We nice. were one of the only brother sister tour guide teams. And we used to have down, we'd go from the upper lot down, we'd have to drive down into the lower lot where the tour really started, where things, where there were things you could see because the first part of the tour was just the upper part of Universal and then you drove down this long hill which was like the hill of death for everybody <laughs> because if you got stuck on the hill there's nothing to point anyone to to see except the hill <laughs> right there's nothing there so you just had, end up talking and you're just talking and talking and if you run out of like your material you you run the risk of getting to one of the other spots on the tour, which was right next to like the the construction warehouse, like the mill. Yeah. Zero. Zero to talk about there. <laughs> so you didn't want to wanna like tell all of your stall stories at the very beginning of the tour, because otherwise then you'd have nothing nothing to talk about. And then it was just like, and we're just gonna be quiet for a few minutes. Yeah, we're just going to hang out. Did you guys go through, just like, the the neighborhoods that were built out? Like, the mm -hmm. Griswolds neighborhood and everything? Cool. Yeah, at that time, what did we go through? We went through Times Square, which was uh, for Back to the Future. Oh, nice. Right? The clock. The clock tower. Yep. So, that was there. New York Street was there. Um, we'd go through King Kong. There was a big King Kong, <laughs> Kong stage. So, we'd go through King Kong. And then, at the end, we'd go through... Um, the Murder, She Wrote set and through Jaws and then up through um, where the Bates Motel was and then all the way up at the end of the tour was, you know, you'd go through this tunnel and it was like this avalanche tunnel. It's like the tram is, you know, it's turning and everyone's uh, freaking out, you know, and <laughs> if you get vertigo, you're like, Ugh, you got to <laughs> kind of like just close your eyes and look ahead, you know. <laughs> So, and then the, and then the tour was done and we say goodbye. See you later. And then, then the next group. No, it's sad that yeah. they just knocked down that back lot, the universal, yeah. the, where they did the Griswolds and mm -hmm. like gremlins and lethal weapon. And, uh, I was talking to Patrick Laberto who was uh -huh. like on little yeah. house of the prairie and stuff. And yeah. I was talking to him like three weeks before because he's just cause he was a kid actor. He's like a historian. Like he was telling me all these stories and like three weeks later, I was like, I saw this video online, and I'm like, oh, this is sad. Yeah, super that sad. Doing There's that. a bunch of sound stages back there now. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. Not yeah, cool. Yeah, which, cool. which is sad. I mean, I used to live right across the street from there, and we could see, you know, we could see the Bates, That's you awesome. know, house, you know, and that was the Hitch, you know, the whole Hitchcock set and stuff like that. But yeah, it's gone. Yeah, I, you're bu well. You're sort of buddy. I don't know if you were friends with him for Mortal Kombat Annihilation, but Brian Thompson started his career in mm -hmm. Universal. Yeah, and that's how he got the Conan show. Was, 
Yes. Okay. Yeah. Did you know he was already, yes. was he there still? He was, let's see. Yeah. Brian was still there. What? Because Cobra. Was, yeah. yeah. Cobra was right around that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Brian, Darren McBee, like a bunch of the gladiators, Gary Casper, Karen Shepard, um, Mark DeCoscos, all of them. So cool that yeah. there's that many people. He was saying like the competition of it because you wanted to be that number one Conan for like that big time slot. And then yes. if a guy got sick or he didn't show, it was like he'd be like, it would keep switching and keep switching. He said, he remember when he got that phone call that day that he got the movie and he was like, I didn't know if they were going to be excited for me because they were auditioning for stuff and not getting the yes. And yeah. that's pretty cool that you were there <laughs> at that same time. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. So what was that first role? So while you're there, obviously you're, you're auditioning. Are you modeling when you're in LA yeah. or doing commercials too? Yep. I modeled for 10 years. I did commercials nice. all the way up until I stopped in 2005. So, but I primarily, after I was modeling for about 10 years, I mean, I had a great agent, stars, Derek Washington, my, my agent for modeling was amazing. Cause he kept, he would push, like he kept pushing, like, he's like, and you got to do commercials. Cause I wasn't even really thinking about commercials when I first got out there. I was just like, Hey, I'm going to model. And I'm going to be an actor. I didn't yeah. really kind of put acting with commercials. And he just started pushing me towards commercials and doing a bunch of stuff in commercials. And, um, yeah. And then after 10 years of modeling, I was like, Ugh, I don't think I can yeah. model. I can't think. I can't do any <laughs> modeling anymore. I just really, you know, I, I, I stopped having the desire for that and really put myself full on into acting. And started training with my acting coach, Rick Walters, who passed away last summer at the ripe old age of like, he was well into his nineties and was still teaching, was still teaching. Yeah. And, you know, I started training with him, let's see, 87, 88, 89, in 89 and was (laughs) with him for forever. And then when I stopped in like 2005, I just stopped going to class because I wasn't going to do any acting and went into the personal growth world and was leading seminars and did that for years and years. And then when I moved back to LA in 2018, started going to class again. Nice. Nice. Yeah. What was that first role? Obviously, this is something you wanted to do since you got that accommodation in uh, fourth grade. But was was there like the (laughs) first time you were on a set? that you nailed a role? Was it like a different world or that you're like, you know what? This is something I could really do for, well, for the rest of my life. Right. Well, the Bill and Ted sucks on adventure was one that was just like that really hit because yeah. it got me in the union and oh, yeah. I made a ton of money and I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can do this. Like I can do this. But then when I really started going out on auditions consistently I would get some every once in a while and then I wouldn't get some and my first acting coach in LA uh, Floyd Levine he's Brian um, oh, got Brian 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 Thompson is it no he was a producer on uh, Brian Robbins I knew it was there somewhere Brian Robbins <laughs> Tolan, Tolan Robbins, they had a huge production company. He was on Saved by the Bell. So his dad, Floyd Levine, was my acting coach, the first acting coach I had in L.A. And he always said, he was like, you know what? One day it's you. One day it's them. One day it's them and not you. You know? <laughs> so it was... It just was what it was. And he's like, Hollywood thrives on mediocrity. If you're too good, you know, you may not get the roles. If you're just kind of average, you'll you'll work, (laughs) you know. So, and I was in this really interesting category where I was six feet tall. And there were not a lot of leading men that were taller than 5'7", 5'8". So, you know, one of the first roles I got and let's see, it was 1990. 
1990, I got a film called Sweet Justice. And Sweet Justice was about this group of gals, ex-special forces and stuff, who come back together to, you know, to bust some bad guys or whatever. I can't even remember yeah. the full story. But on that production, I met a guy who was a stunt coordinator. And he worked, he was a stunt coordinator for one of the bigger, biggest groups, Stunts Unlimited. And he said to me, he's like, hey, you know, I know you're like this big actress and stuff, but if you ever want to do any stunts, let me know. And I was like, well, what would I have to do? And he's like, well, just depends on what you want to do. You know, you do fights and everything, right? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, you know, sometimes they just need someone to just jump out of the way or just just to keep their eyes open and do ND stuff. And I went, okay, cool. And literally like two to three weeks later, he called and was like, hey, you need to go see this other stunt coordinator because they're looking for a double on speed for one of the actresses. Wow. <laughs> okay. So I go in and I meet Gary Himes, who is the stunt coordinator on Speed, and he's like, yep, you're perfect, you know? And I was like, great, I'm going to be doubling somebody, but there was a gal on the bus who was like this featured extra on the bus who was five foot eleven, <laughs> And I went, cool, and ended up having such a blast and went, Okay, cool. And once one of the stunt coordinators from stunts, he was also with Stunts Unlimited, then it kind of became this thing. Oh, hey, there's this six foot tall black chick and she's kind of handy. So <laughs> they just kind of like, you know, kind of like yeah. pass me around the group and here you go. Here's the black chick, you know, because at that time there really weren't any. There were like three of us. And yeah. And that was it. So I had a very, very good career as, you know, as a stunt woman as well in those early days. So that and was, some really and that was cool a blast. Movies. Mm -hmm. Oh, I bet. No, stunt, yeah. I love talking to stunt people because I think it's yeah. so fascinating. It's so uh, it, like real stunts and like watching like those 80s, 90s movies, like actually seeing the people dive out of the way yeah. or actually seeing like CGI just sometimes just takes it away when you, <laughs> when you true. know it's not real looking, but no, yeah. you knocked it out of the park. It was speed, bordello of blood, bulletproof mm -hmm. speed mm -hmm. to blade, like all these movies that you had the opportunity. Yeah. And again, you're on set, you're working. So that's like, that was like an early foray for you. Like totally. being behind the camera. Totally. Cause you're really seeing how everything works. I'm just going to turn some light on here. There we yeah, go. No problem. Look, boo. There hey. I am. <laughs> I'm like, it's getting dark outside. I'm like, oh, better turn this on now. Yeah. <laughs> How about that one there? That's good. <laughs> yeah, it was, I mean, my stunt days, I mean, really my stunt days were almost way better than my acting days because I loved working on the stunt team because it was a team. And, you know, we always... Uh, like on Blade, there were like 10 of us. So that was a blast, you know. And on Speed 2, there were like 10 of us or 14 of us, however many of us, right? And it was just like I always loved being part of the stunt team. And you have your meeting and you're like, this is what everybody's doing. And then we're going <laughs> to do this and then you're going to do that. And it's like awesome. What was the awesome. like – I know they always make sure the stunts are tested because the stunt coordinator wants to make sure that you're safe. Was there ever one that you're like, I don't know, that you had to do? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I had gotten um, one of the master vampires in John Carpenter's Vampires. Oh, awesome and movie. yeah, amazing. And the stunt coordinator was the original stunt coordinator on Mortal Kombat. But on Mortal Kombat Annihilation, he ended up having another gig that overlapped and conflicted. So he couldn't do the show. So it was like, ugh, we had been wanting to work together. So he brought me in to meet John and Sandy on John Carpenter's Vampires. That's awesome. And he had originally called me in and said, hey, do you want to do a fire burn? And I was like, yeah, nope. Uh... <laughs> Nah, 
I'm, I'm good. I'm good on the yeah. fire. And he's like, oh, but it's just going to be. I'm like, Mm-mm, I do not do fire. That's not my thing. So I, and I'm, and I was at that point where I knew enough stunt people to know you don't lie about what you do. <laughs> So I was like, mm, no. And he goes, oh, hold on a second. Let me go ask them, you know, if there's something else they want you to do. So he comes back about 20 minutes later and he goes, okay, they're going to make you one of the masters. And I'm like, oh, okay. He goes, oh, it's no big deal. You just have to crawl out of a grave, do some fights, no big deal. And I'm like, sweet, crawl out of a grave. That sounds so up my alley. You know, thinking, oh, we're going to be in, (laughs) we're going to be in a graveyard and it'll be open. We'll just crawl out, you know, super simple, easy. Mm. Yeah. First day, (laughs) first day on set. First day we go to shoot the the masters. We, they take us out to the middle of like, basically the middle of nowhere in the desert out in Santa Fe. And we get to this wash and there are eight like holes in the ground with all this dirt next to it and they were like okay find a hole lay down and see which one you fit in oh my god i'm like thinking oh okay (laughs) that's interesting so we go lay down and i'm like yeah this what this works and there was this box there was a box right with these two flaps that came over my face go over our face like this and then they're like okay everybody lay down and we had walkie talkies you know open channel walkie talkies inside these graves with us and they proceeded to bury us alive oh my gosh and it was like okay lay down the flaps come down and they just start shoveling dirt over us and it's like wait whoa and then it's getting heavy and there's like the impact on the chest and I'm like oh my god oh I didn't think I was claustrophobic until maybe (laughs) just a little bit you know and then it becomes a mind game it's like no just relax you just meditate with this right and I'm you're trying to listen for direction because it was very specific they were like okay because of the way in which we were placed there was you know there were three lines of us and then Thomas Ian Griffith Valak the master the master of the masters yeah and so it's like it went this 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 and and we all like come out of the ground when we're on cue oh my god and then it was like hurry up yeah hurry up you know because air's running out and you're just like okay (gasps) just just relax just relax just relax you you got this it's okay and then we come out do it again Uh. it's like four (laughs) takes later it was like oh but i tell you something for as scary as it was, it was the coolest scene I have ever had in a movie with all of my acting, all of my stunts. That scene right there was the coolest I've ever done. That's awesome. I, I rewatched that. I watched that movie a ton of times. I think it's so underrated out of the John Carpenter movies. Mm-hmm. Just so good. Yeah, it really is. Wow. It was, and Buried it was alive. just a blast. It was such a blast. We had so much fun. How long would you think? How how long were you actually buried? I know it probably felt Ooh. like hours. We were probably buried, mm, I'd say, three, four, five minutes. Oh, man. Which, yeah. Yeah. And do it again. Ooh. Yeah. You know, I mean, and I remember one time thinking, oh, I'm going to be really clever. And, and it was the first day I'd met John. So, and he's super cool and he's just chill and he's behind the monitor and he's just kind of smoking a cigarette and he's like, okay, action, let's do this. And the second time we did it, I thought I'm going to be clever because my costume was this long dress, right? And I thought, oh, I'm going to be clever because if I lift my legs up, the dirt goes kind of underneath my legs so that it's not so heavy on top of me. Only 
what happened was, <laughs> what had happened was, <laughs> when I came out of the ground, because he was like very specific, your hands come out first, and then your hands come out, and you sit straight up. That's how you come out. And then you get up. So hands come out, sit straight up, go to get up, can't get up, go to get up. Huh. And I'm like, because the dirt had caught my dress, the back panel of my dress, and was weighing it down, and I couldn't get it out of the dirt. Oh, no. <laughs> and he was like, everything was great, except that. He's like, you're up, you're down, you're up. I was like, I am so sorry. He's like, it's all right, don't worry about it, it's all good. I'm like, mm, shit. <laughs> Well, what a great experience. It's so cool yeah. that you had that other like avenue. So when you're directing, totally. I know it's going to happen. You can mm -hmm. talk to the, you know, I've been in your spot here. Go to minute so-and-so. You tell them that story because people, people like when people have done what, done the job. There's like more yeah. of a respect. And it's like, oh yeah, I used to do that. Or, but uh, no, it's so cool that you had that opportunity that somebody came, approached you and you said, yes, not a lot of people say yes, they think about it, and then their opportunity is lost because yeah. they hesitate. Well, exactly. I mean, and for me, it was like, it was kind of like a no-brainer because I had been an athlete my whole life anyways. So I was like, eh, what's going on? You know, I was training boxing. I was training martial arts. I was, sure. you know, doing all that stuff anyway. So they're like, hey, you want to come do a fight? And I'm like, sure, why not? Get paid for it? Why not? <laughs> you know? And then it became like, wow, I... I actually, I really like this. And then I started training more and working with more people and trying to broaden my skills so that I had more to offer than just, you know, jumping out of the way of something. And, yeah. you know, and it was, it was just, it was so cool. I mean, and I really, I almost liked working. I liked working more as a, honestly, working as a stunt person than working as an actor. And then kind of niched out that I was a stunt actor because there was nobody called a stunt actor back then because it was known in the industry that stunt people can't act and actors can't do stunts. And then there's this whole group of us that started working out together that were actors that were athletic that learned how to do stunts. And now, like 20 some odd years later, 30 years later, it's a thing. Like stunt acting is an actual, you know, thing because they oftentimes they'll producers will want someone who can actually act. Yeah. And you want somebody to, who's the main actor that you're watching. You don't want to see like that bad toupee or that bad wig right. or <laughs> when they put a man in a woman's wig yeah. and you see like hairy legs, like jumping off of a building or something, but that's pretty yeah. cool. So sweet justice. When you got that, that was because uh, you had the martial arts background. Did that mm -hmm. have fighting in that? I saw Kathleen yes. Kinmont was in that too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's where I met Kathleen and we became lifelong friends. And yeah, she's awesome. Yeah, she's amazing. She's amazing. And then you were on so, Renegade for a couple episodes, uh -huh. which is pretty cool. Yep. Did a couple episodes of Renegade fighting, which was cool. You know, yeah. Get to use these skills. Yeah. How did that begin? Did you do that just growing up like in Colorado? You do no, martial arts? No, oh. I started training martial arts when I mean, I had taken a couple of classes with my dad when I was young in karate. Um, but once I got to L.A. and then started meeting some people and then found my Kung Fu instructor and I was like, oh, I liked uh, when I dated Mark Dacascos and his dad created One Hop Kune Do Kung Fu. And so I started training with him. And then when him and I split up, one of his dad's students started teaching and I started training with him. And he became my Sifu. And I trained with him for 10 years. Wow. Yeah. It's cool that you had that, that you had that back. So you, you have it all. Like you have that opportunity, like to be able to audition. And then like, yeah. instead of like saying like, oh, we're gonna have to get somebody that can do those, this fight scene, that's five minute fight scene. It's like, oh no, I can do that too. And it's like, all right, right. nice. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was an advantage for me for sure. So the so. big role, I think the coolest role that you had 
Mortal Kombat Annihilation. I think that mm-hmm. such a neat. Obviously, the people could say what they want about the movie. It's it was such a cool follow up, and like you mentioned, like the stunt coordinator. I know obviously the stunt coordinator is important. There was just like these so many things that happened with the movie when it came to like some of the cast being able to be in the second one, whether it had been yes. for maybe they wanted more money or just they were booked and they couldn't do something else. But I think it's such a cool. Mo- I don't know, like you're talking to Brian. And I'll get your sentiment about the movie. But like, when I talked to Brian, he like loved that movie so much because when he was in, he was in a, a martial arts movie and he wasn't doing the martial arts. He was like, man, why? Which uh, with uh, Richard Norton and I should know her name, the martial arts. Uh... Cynthia Rothrock. Yes. Yep. It was. Yeah. It was the movie with them too. As co- I think she was a teacher doing karate, and he was the Richard Norton was a cop and. And uh, Brian was like a drug dealer, like causing havoc in the town. But he was telling me from that movie, he was like, I really should learn this. So he like really started yeah. training and doing everything. And then just just that movie. So how how did that role come about? Was that just an open casting call? Mm-hmm. Did somebody refer you to it because of your stunt work or anything? No, it was an open casting. And my agent had to push to get me yeah. in there. Because, yeah, casting was like, eh, 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 and they hemmed and hawed and hemmed and hawed and hemmed and hawed. And finally, you know, she pushed. I knew Jeff Amata was doing the stunt coordinating on it. And I just went to him and I was like, hey, like, I need I need help getting in the door. <laughs> and I think he pushed. And then I auditioned and auditioned again and then had another call back and then five callbacks later um i think i auditioned seven times for them wow seven times and (laughs) finally they were like okay i don't think we're gonna find anyone else for shiva and i was like no you're not (laughs) yeah that's so cool what what was like the was there any difficult parts of that role like was it like because you wore prosthetics in that movie I wore the arms, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The most difficult part was when the fight got cut. <laughs> I was like, oh, I, was I know. To have, it was so, that was it got hard. cut. It got cut filming or it got cut to be in the movie? It caught bef- got cut before we filmed it. Oh, I was reading yeah. that. When we were going to talk like a few years ago, I was reading about that. And I thought there was an action. I thought it was actually filmed. So they didn't even no. film it? Didn't even film it. No. It was supposed to be me and Reptile okay. in, in triplicate, like Reptile triplet, you know, yeah. can split off into multiple Reptiles. And yeah. it was supposed to be me, Reptile, and Raiden. And they ended up cutting the Shiva part because it was, you know, CGI and it was expensive and it was, you know, it was a million dollar sequence. So, or so, or so I was told, I mean, I don't yeah, know yeah. the exact numbers, but they're like, yeah, it's, it's, it's expensive. Like, and I was just like, but <laughs> she doesn't fight. <laughs> she doesn't fight in the movie. And if she's not going to fight in the movie, then why is she in the movie? Because I said, it's going to piss the fans off because she's so popular in the game. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So people were not happy. <laughs> yeah, that was the Wild West of CGI. It's so funny when you watch yes. movies at that time. Yes. It's really funny when you watch, like, Jurassic Park. And I think even to this day, you watch Jurassic Park, which I know you're in the in Lost World. But it's so funny mm-hmm. just thinking about it. Like, there's movies that came out around that time. That I'm not talking small budget, like, Roger Corman, like, B-movies or anything. Right. That that had their type of CGI. I'm talking like other big, big budget movies because it was such a big, like it was so new that you can have somebody yeah. that was like myself, young, convince someone. And then like you said, like a million dollars a sequence, I believe. And they just hired the wrong person. And after you spend that money, you're not going to, you can't, you can only have so much money to make a film. So that's yeah. why some movies you see bad CGI because they couldn't probably redo it, you know? Right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so better not do it than risk it. Right. I guess. So, yeah, it was a bummer, though. It was truly a bummer because I was really looking forward to that. And I was yeah, that was really going to be like, oh, my God, I finally have a really good fight in a movie as this character. And oh, sorry. No. 
It's 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 one of those series, and I saw it the other day, which it's so funny when they all came out at the same time, because that's the way Hollywood does things. Which I, I why wouldn't you? If something's hot, you go with it. Right. Like Street Fighter, Mortal yeah. Kombat. I was like, oh, this is great. <laughs> and Street Fighter, they're doing another movie. I don't know who's going to be in it or anything. I think there's t- it's like an early talks for it. But Mortal Kombat's one of those movies that since Annihilation came out. There have been so many fan-made movies, and I'm sure you've seen them yes. or people sent you to them. Or, but there was the one with Jax as the cop. Mm-hmm. It was like an 11 minute short, and he was a detective. It was like before yep. he turned. And I'm like, why isn't this the movie? Not nothing against the movie that just came out. I thought it was pretty right. good, but it was like so cool, like almost like a prequel mm-hmm. of seeing like these people like before everything. But uh, yeah, very yeah, cool. Before they were. <laughs> What what they were, yeah. What they were, yeah. He but no, that's cool. Was a cop. I, but it's it stinks that your scene got cut, but it was still obviously yeah. a cool experience to play that character. Yes. So I'm sure so many people like you said it was such a popular character in the game. I'm sure there's so many people that still were like seeing her on the big screen, you know? Yeah, big time. I mean then there's been this sudden revival not not sudden revival you right it's like i have done more interviews and podcasts about the mortal combat universe than anything else (laughs) you know because the 30 year reunion was just i think last year or something like that for the game oh my gosh yeah i'm just like it's just the universe that's never gonna die there's yeah. always going to be Mortal Kombat. Yeah, I think I think it's like it's so crazy. Like, it's not like when it comes to different age groups, but like my age group, there's like this such a nostalgia because at the time when we when I was growing up, I was born in '86. Like mm-hmm. in that time, you're growing up, like computers, like in your my early part of my childhood, computers weren't big. Like if you right. had a computer, it was almost the like in the sixties or fifties when people had a TV, it right. was like sort of rare. Like maybe the rich kid down the street have it. My dad was a garbage man. My mom was a waitress. So like yeah. we didn't have it until years later, but <laughs> it was just like one of those things you had all these. So like video games are just a big thing, but like nostalgia, yeah. I love uh, watching those things from the nineties, talking about things from those nineties, but that's cool that people are uh, it's keeping those things alive. It's totally keeping it alive. Totally. You know, so I'm like, hey, long live Shiva. I don't care. <laughs> long live Shiva. Yes. yes. <laughs> Do you have any other like fr- from the from the re- there's so many other credits that you have, but I think it was cool. You had the opportunity to work with Carpenter again. You mm-hmm. worked with him Ghost uh, on Mars. Ghost of Mars. Ghost of which, Mars. The yeah. crazy thing at the time, did you when you when you're on that set for that movie, did you know that that was supposed to be a Snake Plissken movie? No. And and they just I changed didn't. it. Yeah. I didn't. They just, they're, you know, Sandy was just like, hey, I got this kind of crazy, you know, ghost weird character, you know, <laughs> and do you want to come in and do it? I was like, yeah, sure, of course, you know, it's you guys, of course, yeah. you know, she goes, yeah, you're just going to be this mental patient sawing at your teeth. And I'm like, sweet, <laughs> sounds great. <laughs> Isn't it so great when you really think about like the, the job that you get, like playing pretend, like it's so neat, yes. like. It's like, oh, you're doing this today. And then, oh, in two weeks, it's like, oh, what's that job I have in two weeks? I have to do this. Yeah. Yeah. But then, like, it's been fun. Oh, yeah. And then, right around that time, Beastmaster. So, we were kind of talking about it in the beginning. Uh, Anytime you can get a series that you're on for a while, even Crusade was a few years before that. So, it's kind of like back to back, right? Crusade, and then did that end? And then, right away, like Beastmaster, like a few months after? Mm hmm. Yeah, literally, it was, you know, because Crusade, we're kind of like sort of in that, like, are we going to go? Or are we not going to go? Is it going to happen? You know, we got 13 episodes with the possibility of nine on the back end, and then it didn't happen. And then Beastmaster happened. <laughs> what is <laughs> that like, like as oh, an actor? Okay. What is that like as an actor? Like when you're on a series like that and they go, all right, you're hired, you got the role, we got 13 episodes. Is it something that each time one's done, are people like saying anything or are you guys looking at the ratings? Like, how does that work? You know, I never really watched the ratings. I just, 
you know, I would go to work and we would have a good time <laughs> and they're like, oh, and we're doing this episode, but we didn't get picked up. It was like, wait, what? And the fans kind of went through their whole outrage because Babylon 5 was five years and they were expecting five years of crusade on yeah. the back end of that. And when that didn't happen, it was sort of it was like, oh, the 13 lost episodes of crusade. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But in, in our minds, you know, even going through like, hey, um, you know, we actually did pretty good in the ratings, but it was a conflict of interest with the network and the producers. So you can't do anything about that. As a no, manager. you can't. No, you can't you do can't. anything about it. It's just like, OK, well, I guess on to the next thing. Yeah, that's you the know? worst thing about it. like yeah. it's it's part of life, like who, you know, or whoever's in charge, like. A guy that can come in because yeah. one guy leaves is the new head of the network, and he's like, hey, "I really don't like the show." It's like, but this show does really well. But I don't really, I don't totally. watch it. Totally, it's terrible. And that's a cool cast: you, Gary yeah. Cole, Daniel Day Kim. Like, mm -hmm. all these people are like pretty much about to pop. Like Gary yeah. at this time, which is pretty cool when you think about when you think about that time of seeing him in this type of role. He's Br uh, Mr. Brady, like yes, around this time, ninety seven, ninety eight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was so much fun because it was just like, oh, my God, working with Gary Cole, working with yeah. Gary Cole, you know, and it's like, there's Gary Cole. And we used to just have, you know, it was like a crack up. And he used to say, God, I hope this really goes, you know, because like every series I've ever done is like not ever gone to series. Uh and we were all like, wait, what? Are you the <laughs> like, bad luck? Are you the kiss of death here? Yeah. You know, and then we didn't go and we're all like, Gary. <laughs> Gary. That's the whole thing with Ted McGinley has that uh, curse. He right. was on like two shows in the 80s. He he went on Happy Days, which was on for what, 16 years? It, well, yeah. I don't, think people, yeah. I, don't, I don't think people realize. And then he showed up. It got canceled. And there was another show that he was on, like, right after that. It was on for, like, 20 years. He was on for the last season. It got canceled. Right. <laughs> it's not, and it's just like, oh, my God. <laughs> but, no, it, but what, when one door closes, another door opens. Another Beastmaster, door opens. Yep. And that's cool. Like, you you know, again, obviously, you'd want it to be, like, a long, long run. But I think the yeah. idea of being on a series is great because you're working with the same people. For a long time to shoot 22 episodes. That's a long, right? That's over two years. Yeah. yeah. Well, each, uh, each season was about eight, nine months. Oh, okay. It takes about nine months to do 22 episodes. You know, if you factor in like we shot in Australia, so the seasons are different. Oh, that and must've been awesome. Yeah. So that was cool. You know, living in Australia for like three years, it was great. And so the seasons, because they're different, you know, summer is over December, you know, November, December, January, February, that's summer. And all the rest of it is like, you know, you go to summer and then fall and then, you know, you got your spring, your winter and then your spring, you know. And we shot from like September... We'd shoot like September around to May, but then we'd have that time period off over the holidays, but then come back and have to do pickups and, you know, or we start, I can't remember, or we started in May and then went all the way through January, but it was, it, it was structured a little bit differently for as far as the way in which they worked with the actors down there because they'd guarantee a certain number of days. So you got your guarantee of days and then anything on top of that was just a bonus. Oh, nice. So it wasn't like, oh, we're going to put you in 10 out of the 22 episodes. It's like, we're going to work you the number of days and that could span, you know, you could work one day on every episode, right? Yeah. But it ended up where in the first season I was in, the se well, season two, I had a certain number of days and then by the end of the season, they were like, Hey, you know, your character is doing really well and, and rating really well. And so we're going to have to 
take you from being the bad guy to being the good guy. Because if cool. we keep you a bad guy, we're going to have to kill you. <laughs> and we don't want to kill you because you're doing really well in the ratings. Yeah. So we're going to make you a good guy. So I, you know, went from being a bad guy when I was first in, the character was first introduced to being a good guy in season three. So, and, and then ended up getting double the days in season three than I did in season two. Nice. So, so cool. The fan, really cool. the fan saying, oh man, we really like this mm-hmm. character. Yeah. And then it changes everything for you. You know, you might've been off. Yeah. Yeah, it changed it all, and it was awesome. Like, it was so awesome. Yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> How about, I always like asking people this about their career. Like, over the years, like, obviously you don't know, like, when you're in the moment, like, like a like appreciating, like, what you're doing, like, maybe for the first time, like, the first time you're on set, like, Bill and Ted, or even, like, your first big modeling gig. Did you ever keep any mementos over the years? Like when you're on a set, like call sheets or outfits or anything? Yes. Nice. I, I kept every single contract, every call sheet. I had at one point in time every script. And then I thought, oh, God, they were all in storage. And then I thought, mm, I can't keep lugging these things around. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So I just kept like certain ones. Like I kept my Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure script because it was the first movie role I ever spoke. So I kept that. But I kept all my contracts to see like, you know, where I came from. Like, oh, this is how much I made then. And here's where I'm at now. And oh my God, this is kind of cool. And I kept, um, I have my costume from Beastmaster. Nice. And I have my costume, part of my costume from a movie of the week I did called Code Red, The Rubicon Conspiracy. And there were a couple other things I think I kept here and there. Like one of the the coolest things is when you're on a cast like Beastmaster or or Crusade, they give you um, for your chair a chair back the director's uh. chair, chair back. So I have my chair backs from Mortal Kombat, from Crusade, and from Hostage. That was, Hostage was the only movie that I was on besides, you know, besides um, Mortal Kombat that I actually have a chair back from. That's really so, cool. I, those are really cool. How about Carpenter? Did he give any good gifts? I heard he gives really good gifts sometimes um, on movies. God, did we have any... Maybe when he first started, that was the thing he did. Yeah, I don't remember, but they treated us so well. I mean, oh, yeah. Sandy King is like a legend with her crews. I mean, she just treated everybody so, 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 so well. And that was part of the joy of working for them is because Sandy had definitely had the gift of hospitality and she took care of everyone. Yeah, no, he yeah. just a rock and roller man. He's got that rock and roller mindset. Him and his boys, and then yep. Nick Castle went on, obviously mm-hmm. playing Michael Myers, directing. Uh, the piano player, his name slips my mind. Tommy, uh, he directed Halloween three, and he directed Fright Night Part two. He's directed right. like a bunch over the years. Tommy Lee Wallace, he was mm-hmm. the piano player, I think. But yeah, those three guys in a band, and then they yeah. hit it big with this Halloween movie, and then. Uh, the yeah. rest is history. And, I know, right? And, yeah. then, and that's all she wrote, right? Yeah. So what yeah. are so what are some other things? Obviously, you know, you, you, angel investor. You know, you need mm-hmm. you for the for the movie. Is there yeah, any? Do you want to like? Is there any particular genres you'd want to direct? Is there one that you have your mindset on? Yeah, I love sci-fi, fantasy, action. Okay. That's kind of my thing. I'm not really like, ooh, let me do this big drama. (laughs) Not really my thing. So the movies that I gravitate to are, you know, more along the action type thing. You know, the one of the projects I'm writing is a fantasy um, action picture, and the Darren McVie project is just straight up like action comedy action, and it's well comedy action drama it's it's we're making an 80s movie on purpose so (laughs) you know it's about four guys four veteran police officers who um get 
thrown under cover, cover as a bad 80s rock band in order to bust a drug and sex trafficking ring. And wow. they're this bad hair band. And it's just like, ooh, right? So. What, what age are the guys? Really like 40s? Um, no, they're much older than that. Oh. <laughs> they were supposed to be 40s, but they're all older now. Because when they first started it, they were all forty. Oh, nice! And it's like twenty years later now, so they're they're like late fifties, early sixties, and it's Ooh. hilarious because you know part of the humor of it is that they are getting older, and they're like, "What? Wh- how are we going to go on? Why are we going undercover as like this <laughs> rock band? Like we haven't played music for twenty years, you know?" So that's part of the comedy of it, and yeah. Call so, Brian up. It'll Get be Brian funny. Thompson in that. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know. If, yeah. I don't know if you, there was a movie a few like recently that came out uh, VFW. It was about a guy like VFW. older guys hanging out of the. Uh, Fred Williamson, the Hammers in it. Uh, yep. yep. William Sadler's in it. Oh, uh, Martin Marty VFW. Marty Cove. It's like I all of those. Him. It's like all of that era of guys. That you era. think. And it like these vampires from doing like, these people take these bad drugs, like these punks and they get mm-hmm. like kind of infected and they storm the bar. But it's like such a cool movie because you see these guys that you see basically from when they were younger, grown all the way up. Like I chatted right. with William Sadler and I think he's like one of the coolest guys, like great, great actor yeah. and just so down to earth yeah. came from the middle of nowhere in New York and then became, right. uh, you know, who he and is. Became, but Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just like you, Minnesota to Colorado to ASU, and then uh, ASU and Hollywood. So cool! No, it's so cool the the modeling aspect and the fact that just so happened it was at that time they were filming college movies at ASU, and yes. you were somebody was like, "Hey, you should be a PA on this movie," and then from Campus Man you go to the next movie, and then Maybe. somebody just, "Hey, can you drive my car to LA?" Isn't it crazy? Yeah. And you really think about these moments in yeah. life that put you where you are today or the moments that you had in big the past time, big time. It, it's, it's really like, it's wild. Like it's wild. Yeah. I think back and you know, I had, um, at one point in time, I don't even know where I met him. I think I may have met him at, uh, I worked as the guest list girl, um, uh, for the Palladium nightclub on Saturday nights for four years. And I had, they had hired me because they had seen me in a music video for somebody and they were like, Hey, we've got an ad. We want that girl in our ad. So I did this ad and it's, it was this big, huge campaign for the Palladium Hollywood. And it ended up being a billboard in Hollywood. And they're like, we want you to come work at the club. Can you come work at the club? And I was like, sure, why not? I'll make a you know, hundred <laughs> bucks a night, $400, uh, you know, a month with cash was like yeah. stellar back then, <laughs> yes. you know, the eighties and nineties. It's like, heck yeah, hundred bucks a night cash. I'll do it. Right. <laughs> and I don't know how it even came apart, but I, I guess, you know, either Barry Gordy, who was, you know, big, huge, massive producer, music producer had said to me like, Hey, do you want to, you know, make music and, you know, be a singer? And I was like, yeah, no. (laughs) And my girlfriend was like, look, you know, if Barry Gordy's asking you, they'll just train you to be a singer. And I was like, yeah, singing is not my thing. I don't want to be a singer. And, you know, I look back now and go, you know what? After I saw all of the friggin' singers making movies, I thought, you're an idiot because you could have been a singer and gotten a movie. Yeah. <laughs> Your acting career would have taken off. Oh, well. Well. That's <laughs> crazy. What it is. That's yeah. so crazy that he saw you. And because obviously, super attractive. You were a model for all those years. And it's so great right. that he found you from that. And he goes, you know what? Yeah. Do you ever think about singing? Yeah. No, not really. (laughs) (laughs) I did not know how to play the Hollywood game. Just didn't know how to play it. So, oh, well. well. It's what it is. Well, Marjane, this has been awesome. I'm so happy we connected. This has been great. year and a half, two years later. Two years later. Yeah, this will be on a few weeks. And are you on on Instagram or anything? Just so I can keep tabs on uh, 
like when yep. the movie comes out or yeah, fingers totally. crossed that it's Instagram, soon. Instagram, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, let's see, LinkedIn. But right, cool. yeah, I've got a show that I'm putting together with an, another one of my buddies' partner that I I was on another podcast and we hit it off. So we're actually going to do something called the Movie Verse, which is a where worlds collide in front of the camera and behind the camera because he's an artist and a comic book artist and a writer cool. and a special effects guy and an editor and here I am an actor and a stunt woman and everything like that so we're going to do something called the movie verse and we're going to review movies that both of us really like from the sci-fi action fantasy genre cool yeah so we're putting that together that'll be on youtube and we're rad yeah i'll make sure i'll put it on to my get that done yeah yeah at the end of the month. it's fun it's really yeah. fun like because movies are great like when you're watching them i love watching movies mm -hmm. but it's so fun when you're watching it and you're going to talk about it because you kind of like look yes. at it in a different way it's yeah. not like it's like uh, it's, it's fun but uh yeah i'll make sure yeah. to follow you and i'll i'll check awesome. everything out and uh Good luck. This has been awesome. Yeah, so happy that we connected. This has been great. And when I have a great I night. saw your email again, the, the sequel, I'm like, hey, I'm the sequel yeah. queen. Yes, you I are. I do part two of everything. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Marjean. Have a All great right, night. All right, Doug. Thank you. Bye.